evening uh, drive time edition of Knicks Fan TV Live presented by KnicksFanTV.com. And it is a special edition show because it is the quarter season report. CP the franchise here and special guest. You guys know him. Needs no introduction, but he's our guy, Fred Katz, Knicks insider. Covers the Knicks for The Athletic. We're going to get into it and uh, just talk about where this team is. The good, the bad, the ugly at 13-9. and nine, or Just about the quarter season mark. So lock in, hit that like button, hit the share button, and subscribe to the channel. You can also call us up, uh, 657-383-1509, or hit us up on the KFTV Discord. Let's get it going. All right, let's turn down the uh, theme music here. All right, there we go. Fred, how you feeling, man? Welcome back. I'm, I'm great. I'm so yeah. happy to be on with you. You're yeah. always showing me up every time we're on. I'm like <laughs> scraggly. <laughs> I've got, I've got like chest hair popping out of my shirt, and you always look like you, you just got your just lines did. done. The yeah. beard is yeah. just is it is perfect. Appreciate it, is, it, man. You really have the perfect beard. Yeah. It's unbelievable. I, I appreciate I, it, man. I look like I just woke up from a seven day coma. <laughs> it's perfect. Perfect. It's great. You can tell who has the show and and who who has who, who's just like sitting in front of a wall. Like I could be a prisoner. Right Check it in from Central Booking downtown New York City. <laughs> <laughs> man, I you know what? I, I was really hoping we were gonna connect in Vegas, man. I, I booked studio time. I had it going Saturday, 12 p.m. Pacific time, prime time, East Coast. I was looking forward to that, man. They fell just a bit short in the in-season tournament. What was your, I guess, your your thoughts before it started and then after, you know, going through the whole journey with the team? Yeah, I was I was ready for that show, man. I was ready to do it. And I I, I picked on my podcast, The Bucks, to win that game. Mm. And then after I recorded that podcast, I kind of regretted my pick because I really started to think about it more. And I started to think about it, And I still think this, even after the Knicks gave up 146 points in that oh, game, boy. that the healthy the healthy Knicks are kind of a good matchup for the Bucks. Like Mitchell Robinson, who I'm sure we'll talk a lot about today. Yeah, is, yeah. It's really tough for them to handle. They don't have anybody who can really guard Jalen Brunson, Julius was obviously incredible in that game. And then the Bucks decided they were just going to hit 482 three-pointers. And so it wouldn't really matter. Uh, what are my thoughts on on the Knicks leading into the tournament? Or what were my thoughts well, on Well, uh, just like yeah. after watching them go through it, the, the competitive nature of it. Uh, I mean, you know, them beating the Heat to get that quality win. They they go out and have to win by large margin against the Hornets. I mean, what did you think of the, how they navigated that in the interest tournament? I'm into the in-season tournament as a concept. I I think it was pretty fun. I think it made it certainly didn't make any of the regular season games any worse. My worry about teams throwing the final because it didn't count as a regular season game, at least with the two teams who participated in it this time with the Pacers and Lakers, yeah. absolutely did not come to fruition. Both teams played, you know, really rid ridiculously hard in that yeah. game. Clearly nobody was mailing it in. And so I think in that sense, I was into it. I do think there are flaws that need to be ironed out. And I'm sure Knicks fans will agree with me on this. Nobody got screwed like the Knicks did mm. when it came to the in-season tournament. Like the Knicks, and I wrote this, the last day of group play in the in-season tournament, they had to beat Charlotte by a lot in order to make it in because they couldn't just finish three and one in group play. They had to get the point differential, right? Yeah. And if they beat Charlotte narrowly, then they weren't going to get into the in-season tournament play. And, and I wrote about it leading into it. Like there is a world where the Knicks are best off just money aside. Obviously they want to win the money and that is the prevailing factor. Right. I, I don't knock them for that. But if you just consider the basketball, like there is a world where the Knicks are better off beating Charlotte by like four, still having that count as, as much of a regular season win <laughs> as if they won by 24, which is what they did not making the in season tournament and having a chance of playing a crappy team. What actually happened is as everybody knows now is they made the in season tournament. They had to play the bucks on the road with the second best record in the Eastern conference. They lost that game. 
which then they had to play Boston in a consolation game on the road, was the best record in the Eastern Conference. And now they're going to play 42 road games and 40 home games. They, they don't even get screwed from a home road split standpoint. They don't even get screwed from a, a um, strength of schedule standpoint where now they play Boston five times and Milwaukee five, five. times. Yeah. That bothers me less than the home road stuff. Mm-hmm. I just do not think they have to fix it mm-hmm. so that every team plays the same number of home and road games. Yeah. You, yeah. Cannot, you cannot end the season with a team playing 42 on the road and right. 40 at home. Right. It's just that's 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 too objectively not fair. Everyone's strength of schedule already differs a little bit, you know. Yeah, you yeah. play some teams three te- three times, some teams four times, and you play the other conference two times. Like it already varies a little bit, and it, and it's small enough that we don't discuss it. And one mm-hmm. extra game against the Bucks, one extra game against the Celtics, while it sucks, is is not making me think the whole thing needs to be disposed of. Yeah. But you can't have Tweet. a team playing more Tweet. road games than home games. Yeah, uh, they also got screwed from a financial standpoint. Maybe we don't know yet mm. because they lost a home gate. Mm. They lost money from a home gate. Right, right, right. They lost concessions from yeah. a home gate. And I've I've spoken to the league, and the league has plans to make it up to the teams who missed the home game. The teams who are mm. going to play forty home games this year. The league league has plans for reimbursement. Okay, but but I don't know how they're calculating that and we know how the Knicks handle things right well will the Knicks be absolutely thrilled with the with the league's plans for reimbursement yeah or will they say that actually they should be getting more money because of x y and z uh I'm just I'm waiting to see how the league decides to handle that part too because that that's that's complicated for you know tons of non-basketball reasons and now that Dolan has you know taken a back seat from what was the board of governors well, I mean, I, I wonder, you know, what he's thinking now. Like, man, here they get the fixes Dolan, in again. And Dolan has said in lawsuits that the league can't handle the the Knicks Raptors situation because they have a bias against the Knicks in this scenario. Mm. Like, like there's there's a. I'm so curious to see how that part plays out. Too, yeah, because that that is like a really interesting business thing, and it is subjective how much you would have made. Like, I don't know if the league is going to say. At the end of the year, your average gate was X dollars, and so we will reimburse you for X extra dollars. Your average concessions was this, so we'll reimburse you for that. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how the league is going to do it. I don't know if they know how they're going to do it yet. A lot of this is all very new. It's just, you know, we're little, you know, when I was hitting up people about this to try to learn more about it, the general mm-hmm. reaction I got was people texting me back saying you enjoy NBA minutia way too much <laughs> to which I said, yeah, <laughs> Hey, that's why you that's do true. what you do. Right. That's why yeah, you that's, do what that's you 100% do. That's a hundred percent true. Yeah. I don't deny that. Yeah. But give me an answer. Right. Right. No, that, it, it's, it's, uh, that it's very interesting, man. And then now some new revelation, we definitely going to get to the basketball part, but some new revelations came out with, in, in regards to the Knicks versus Raptors lawsuit. Uh, what, what are you hearing now? And where do you think stand with, with that? I mean, how much time we have? Three hours, <laughs> five hours, seven days. Where 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 do things stand with that? They're getting increasingly contentious. So the Raptors responded today to the Knicks' response to the Raptors' response, which mm-hmm. was to the Knicks' response to the Raptors' response to the Knicks' response. Yeah. And for the first time, we have a story up in the Athletic that uh, my colleague Mike Vorkanov mm-hmm. wrote. He's really taken on the brunt of reporting on this. Uh, it's just so in his in his wheelhouse. He's our business reporter now. Mm-hmm. Shout out to Vork, yep. basketball, yeah, business mm-hmm. and basketball reporter now, and and was the Knicks beat writer at the Athletic before me. So it's just so in his wheelhouse. And he's mm-hmm. an amazing reporter. But I mean, Vork had a story up there today, really talking about um, how it was outlined in this latest response that the Raptors have now kind of hinted at the possibility of a defamation countersuit. Wow, which is wow. something. That would be very newsworthy. Yeah. Um, the Raptors have consistently said throughout this whole lawsuit, and for those who don't know, the Knicks are accusing the Raptors of, uh, you know, a, a video coordinator went from the Knicks to the Raptors this summer, mm-hmm. and the Knicks are accusing the Raptors of that video coordinator bringing with him proprietary files to the Raptors, and not just doing that, but doing it at the direction of Raptors leadership mm. of their 
their head coach mm-hmm. and other people and all these people with the Raptors who the Knicks say access those files. Uh, the Raptors are saying that it's not true. There was no direction and there were no files. I, I don't know what to make of this. Mm-hmm. I don't know how this is going to continue to go on. You talk to people around the league about this and people taking their work with them is a very common thing. And, and without getting too inside baseball, the types of files that um, this guy took with him, Ike Azadam, the types of files that he took with him were from Synergy Sports, which is this big database that has stats and film mm-hmm. and all that kind of stuff. And it seems as if the files that he took were clips that were from Synergy. And you can you can create playlists and edit playlists and categorize film and that kind of stuff on Synergy. But mm-hmm. it's not like... They, the, what the Knicks see when they go to Synergy.com is any different than what the Raptors see. Yeah, yeah. When they go to SynergySports.com, SynergySports.com, not Synergy.com. And uh, and so generally, a lot of people you talk to people around the league, a lot of people say, "Yeah, well, you take your work with you." You know, he was hired by the Raptors to do the same job. He doesn't want to make the same playlists. He took his work with them. The Knicks are saying that they have to take this out and let the can't let the league handle this because Adam Silver has a bias against the Knicks and toward Larry Tannenbaum, who yeah. you know runs MLSE, the mm-hmm. parent company of the Raptors. Mm-hmm. Dolan has stepped down from boards, alleging bias against him. It's messy. It, it's <laughs> it's messy. It is messy. <laughs> it's a lot. And one thing that I can say is I would be surprised if it went away anytime mm. soon. Mm. Okay. Like I would be surprised if tomorrow there were just a settlement and maybe I'm looking like an idiot, mm. but part of the reason the Knicks say they're taking this to court is because the maximum fine that a team can get from the league is $10 million. And the Knicks say they view damages to be more than $10 million. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> when the Knicks alleged that, and this is all public in legal filings, mm-hmm. when the Knicks lawyers alleged that, I received a text from someone who is in a, um, let's say he does a lot of video work mm-hmm. for an unrelated team. Mm-hmm. And, or, you know, I can say he an advanced scout mm-hmm. from another team. And this person says to me, unprompted, sends me the link of that story. With, which has that information in it and says, I could send every single bit of work I've done all season to all 29 teams for an entire season. And it wouldn't be worth $10 million. Right. So, right, so, right, right. So, you know, we'll see. Uh, the Knicks have not named specific damages beyond saying they think it's more than $10 million. I don't know how it's going to go, but this is the language is getting contentious yeah. on both sides. Mm. It, okay. The accusations are getting contentious on both sides. It does not seem like it's revving down or coming to a compromise. Mm. Uh, the Raptors have flat out said now in this latest filing that they think that the Knicks are doing this purely to embarrass the people involved. Mm. Uh, it, it's, and that's why they want it in the public eye as opposed to handled by the league. It, it's, it's a lot. Like it's it's getting very aggressive. <laughs> Meanwhile, they just they just played last night. Right. And then and then people are wondering, like, oh, could the Knicks get OG and an Obi? It's like <laughs> I have no idea. I, I have no idea it. if they're able to separate this stuff or yeah. if there's like there's no way we're I don't see it. Together, man. I don't see it. Not not without attacks. U- Ujiri's not letting that go without attacks, man. So, but but you're right. They did take their uh, frustrations out of the Raptors last night, one thirty six to one thirty, and, and we got to look at the new look Knicks because for the next two months, this is a new look team, man. So much because the block nest mods and Mitchell Robinson, his absence, it has so many touch points on this team. Let's start defensively because. As happy as I was to see them snap that two-game losing streak last night, happy as I was to see Randall just dominating OG and, and Scotty Barnes, yeah, whoever they threw at him, playmaking very well, uh, you know, Quentin Grimes, all these, so many storylines from, from the offensive side. Defensively, they still gave up 130 points. Their defensive rating has dipped a little bit since uh, a couple weeks ago. 
three point defense, obviously against the Celtics and Bucks, is that you know those teams being who they are, or is that more of the Knicks' defensive lapses? I mean, how do they navigate this thing without Mitch, though? Who who you know it's kind of that straw that stirs the drink, especially in the middle. Yeah, there's no question he's their most important defender, and not only that, but now in a, in a move that I don't think anybody should have a problem with, Quentin Grimes isn't in the starting lineup anymore either. And right. he is your go-to point of attack defender. And so now you're without your most important overall defender and your most important point of attack defender in the first unit. You're going to be more vulnerable. Now, I think part of the Bucks and the Celtics games were just like those teams being ridiculous. I didn't think the Knicks were good defensively against Milwaukee at all. Mm. But like Milwaukee shot 23 of 38. <laughs> right. You could give them right. wide open three pointers and if they shoot 23 of 38 it's like well they shot they shot 61 percent from three yeah what are you going to do uh they did not play well defensively but they didn't play that badly boston is just a nightmare for them porzingis was ridiculous in that game mitch got hurt halfway through not even halfway through uh, came back in a little bit in the third quarter, but he didn't look the same. And Porzingis is just a nightmare matchup for Terrible him. Terrible matchup. I, yeah. I th- yeah. think he might be the worst matchup for him in the league, honestly. Mm-hmm. Not just not just because he takes threes. He takes them from so deep. And he's got the quickest release and the quickest trigger. And it just really is is really tough for any center to be able to get out. That That Boston team is just insane. And... Against Toronto, I thought their transition defense was particularly bad. They, yeah, oh yeah, they, oh yeah, especially in the beginning of the first half, it's terrible. Totally, yeah, and and they weren't completing their defensive possessions. Is the other part of it, and that has a lot to do with Mitch, right? Mm-hmm. Seventeen offensive rebounds for Toronto. That yeah. doesn't happen if Mitch plays in that game. Yeah, like that's there's no way that happens. They played such a clean game when they played in Toronto, like a week and a half ago. And the reason, part of the reason it was such a clean game was because Mitch wrecked those dudes. Yeah. Yeah, he he did. Great. He was great in that game. He, he, he really owned Pirtle and really owned the paint. Those 17 offensive boards don't happen. So I, that's a, that's a big reason why. And and maybe that's something that Knicks fans are just going to have to get more used to. I don't think the Knicks are going to turn into a a bad rebounding team Mm -hmm. without Mitch. I really don't. Most of the players in their rotation are good rebounders. And and Hartenstein is a solid enough defensive rebounder, really good offensive rebounder. Hart is a lead on both sides. Mm-hmm. Barrett's a good rebounder. Quickly's a good rebounder. DiVincenzo's a good rebounder. You're like, you go through it. They play a lot of good rebounders. Mm-hmm. And I think they'll still be a solid rebounding team. But they are, like most teams, going to be susceptible to just getting beaten up on some nights. Whereas they were kind of immune to it before. It basically just never happened because Mitch is so dominant. And and we saw that effect against Toronto, for sure. Uh, they do need to iron out that transition defense, though, because they were, like, yeah. giving up quick makes after makes. After you makes. Know, like, you can't. Right, right. You just can't do that. You can't do that. They did that against Milwaukee, too. Like, yeah, that, that was the problem against – that was a big problem against Milwaukee. What do you think about – you know, in in terms of – because I just feel like point of attack, they're so weak. And, and as Brunson has been a godsend for this team, but vulnerable defensively. And now he's gimpy a little bit. That's a little bit of a concern. But, you know, when I looked at he and DiVincenzo out there last night, a lot of the issues, especially in, in transition, you know, you would catch those guys on cross matches. And maybe that's just, you know, Toronto being who they are because outside of Schroeder, I mean, everybody's 6'5 and up, it seems like, who they who they roll out there. Maybe outside of Schroeder and Flynn and and uh, and, and the shooter there that comes off the bench, his name is slipping me. But what, you ever ask Tibbs why he never, why he never tried to sprinkle in like maybe a zone every now and again, just, just to switch things up? You know, obviously Spolstra goes to it. Missoula likes to mix things up a little bit to try to quell some momentum. I mean, when the Knicks struggles like this to to guard the three-point line, and now you have Mitch being out, you have tips like, why not maybe sprinkle some of that in? It's a great question. I've never asked him that, but now I'm going to. That's That's a really good question. Like, with Mitch being out, would you be more susceptible to sprinkling in a little, a few zone possessions here? here or there he never does it right they they never play zone 
my my now I'm gonna take a guess yeah. on what his answer will be. My guess is he's so routine oriented. I think Tibbs is either stubborn or routine oriented, depending on your perspective of him. In this case, I would call this more routine oriented than, mm. than, than stubborn. He's so routine oriented that he likes guys guarding in their familiar sorts of ways. And parts of the reasons that he can be slow to adjust is because he believes that if you are if you just start to execute the coverage the way it's supposed to be executed, it's going to work. And the more you keep doing it, the more you will get comfortable doing it and the better you will get at it. And I'll take the hit right now because it's going to pay dividends down the line. And he doesn't really look for band-aids in that sense. And in this case, like going to a zone when they never do that, and that's not a tips thing. And it's not this personnel thing is, is a Band-Aid, right? It's a little, it's a little bit of a gimmick, and Tibbs doesn't really do that stuff. So my my guess is that we don't see that. But I would love every once in a while Tibbs will like really expand on his basketball beliefs and why he thinks work thinks things work and don't. Mm-hmm. I feel like he might give a really interesting answer to that. Uh, something yeah. that I would I would I you or I would never think of. It's a great question. Yeah, I I should ask him that at an upcoming availability, especially with Mitch out, like. Does that make you any more? Also, like you're starting Jericho Sims, quick foot speed can cover a lot of right. Can cover a lot of area. Uh, you you have guys who are generally going to be pretty good in those concepts, and they use zone concepts, you know, mm-hmm. in in their defense a lot. The way they guard the weak side, a lot of zone concepts there, but they don't really play like a straight up two three, you know. Yeah, yeah, uh, but. But I could see quickly being good in a zone. Uh, I could see DiVincenzo being really good in a zone. Hart being really good in a zone. Uh, it could be a way to kind of alleviate Jalen Brunson of of teams trying to attack him and mm-hmm. that kind of stuff. And I could see Sims Sims doing it too. The other thing that you take in a zone as well, though, is your rebounding is probably going to take a hit. Yeah, well, yeah, and I'm sure that's that's Tibbs. He, he definitely doesn't want that as a guy who prides in, in rim protection and rebounding for sure. For sure, your rebounding is probably going to take a hit in the zone because it's a lot harder to rebound when you're in a zone, and that might not be something he's he wants to sacrifice right now. And again, mm-hmm. I don't think they're going to be like a below average rebounding team without Mitch. I think they'll be an above average rebounding team still. Yeah. You look at the on offs and like. When Mitchell Robinson isn't on the floor, they, so far this season, they rebound like the ninth best defensive rebounding team in the league. Mm-hmm. That's based on defensive rebound rate. Mm-hmm. And the third best offensive rebounding team in the league. So that's still a very good rebounding team. And I don't think those numbers will hold at quite those spots because a lot of that is because it's like Hartenstein going against backups. Yeah. And now it's Sims and Hartenstein going against starters. So I think those numbers will come down some. And and part of it is that guys are just so freaking exhausted from the minutes they have to go against Mitchell Robinson. That right. It creates these other habits and they're less aggressive throughout the game. Uh, but, but yeah, I could see Tibbs not wanting to go into something that can mess with the rebounding too, before he really gets an idea of what quality of a rebounding team that they are in the present. And, and as you said, he's he's a man of routine, a coach of routine, tends to not make most changes until about 20 games in to evaluate things. So that's what makes the Grimes two games, two games short, you know, sh- short sample size, but certainly looking very, very comfortable now coming off of that bench. I mean, he, he was really good last night, but now with Mitch out <laughs> and you take your your best perimeter defender out. Tibbs, he's not a guy that will tinker. You know, like a guy like a Spolstra, he might make that change right away. But, you know, I think that's another, that might be another question for Tibbs is, I don't know if you, if you asked him that last night, but like, what does he think about Grimes now that Mitch is out? Will he consider, you know, putting Grimes back in there uh, just to get more of a defensive focus in the lineup? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a question we're asking. It's something I wrote about in my story this morning about maybe if there's a world where they feel like, okay, you lost some defense with Mitch. One way to make it up in the first unit is to make it up on the perimeter. Well, a good way to protect the rim is just make sure nobody gets to the rim to begin with. Right. Quentin Grimes is kind of the guy who is going to be the best at that from in terms of guarding ball handlers and all that. He almost always, when he was in the starting lineup, would guard the other team's best perimeter player period that being said 
I don't think you need to put him back in. Mm. At least not now. Mm -hmm. Because look at what's happened. Like, yeah. Quentin Grimes never actually needed to say a thing, right? Like, Quentin Grimes stands up there in front of all of us after that Milwaukee game last Tuesday and talks about how it's really difficult to get into a rhythm when he's getting as few touches and as few shots as he's getting. And then that next game, he goes to the bench and he shoots three of seven from three and scores a bunch in like nine, scores 13 points in 19 minutes. And then against Toronto, scores 19 points in 27 minutes. He shoots five of seven from three. And he's he's getting the ball. He's running around screens. He's yeah. repositioning himself from the corner to the wing. He's 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 dribbling around a screen and then pulling up from three and hitting it like he yeah. is playing. How about bringing rhythm. the ball up? I mean, something that Macri said on Twitter, and it's like, yeah. you're right, man. When was the last time you saw outside of Summer League or Rising Stars that Quentin Grimes bring the ball up to start, to start a play? 100%. He is playing with a rhythm and a confidence that I don't think you need to mess with right now. And And by the way, like I said, Grimes did not need to say anything because as Grimes is starting that game, Whatever he was at the time, three for five and 12 minutes, his first 12 minutes or whatever from three, maybe four for six from three in his first 12 minutes. At that same point, Dante DiVincenzo had also played 12 minutes and had not taken a shot. Right. So the roles have reversed as they have reversed roles. Uh, it, it's, it's clear that whoever is in that spot in the starting lineup is going to struggle to get a good amount of shots. And you could still close with Grimes. Like, they closed with Grimes against Toronto. Yeah, they did. You they know? did. And he yeah. still played, yeah. he played 27 minutes. It's not like if he were starting, he'd be playing 36. He would still probably play about 27, 29 minutes. So if you can play 27 minutes and close and feel more comfortable and get in a rhythm off the bench and play well, then I'm like, I get it. You don't need to mess with it when you just jerked him out of the starting lineup two games ago. And, and once again, we're talking to Fred Katz, Knicks insider for The Athletic. Salute to everybody in the chat once again. Hit the like button, hit the share button, and subscribe to the channel. Um, the evening commute edition of Knicks Fan TV Live. And salute to our franchise channel members in the chat right now. Now, the... I hate to say gripes because, you know, they're 13-9, and nine, they're still winning games. But the gripes in terms of not being involved. It was, it was Mitch last year and this year. Hart started it this year. Grimes. I, I have, I'm still trying to figure out like what is the primary cause of, of this? It, it seems natural. I mean, just watching the NBA over, over time, guys will get disgruntled in the locker room and want to be involved, right? And want the ball more. It's not uncommon. But my question is, is it an RJ Julius Brunson issue? Like how we talked about with DiVincenzo and Grimes. Is it a scheme issue? You know, which one would you would you uh, put, pin this on closely in, in terms of lack of involvement by, by your role players? I think it's kind of a chicken or egg situation. Right, it's, right. It's there are probably elements of both. Uh, one thing I will say is people talk about when everybody's healthy and the Knicks are playing their regular rotations. People talk about how beautiful the ball movement is with the bench. Rightfully so. They have some gorgeous possessions. That's the same system. Yeah. Those are yeah. the same yeah. principles. <laughs> they are right. playing with the same objectives, <laughs> but they're different people with different skill sets and who think the game differently and have different styles and thus they play differently. I, I always think it's funny when people are like, oh, Tibbs' system, he doesn't want to move in the ball, but look how the bench moves the ball. It's gorgeous. I'm like, it's the same system. They don't have like a bench coach who just coaches the bench lineups. It's the same system. Tibbs does not whip out some ridiculously complicated playbook. That's not how they play. They run some pistol actions. Yeah. They run some stuff to get mismatches. And it's worked well in the regular season. Worked really well in the regular season last year. And they're 10th in the league in offense right now. And that's mm -hmm. after that you know, monstrosity of a start from Randall and, and Brunson even struggling inside the two-point arc for, for parts of this season uh, and, and Grimes kind of vanishing. Like, they're still 10th in the league in offense. They're making their threes. They're getting a good amount of them. Tibbs actually wants them taking 
taking even more threes than they've taken already. That's something that he, I know that he's emphasized like, yeah, we've been taking a good amount of threes. need to take a great amount of threes. I would say that it's a little bit of both because what Tibbs does is he basically empowers the player to play like the player. And so if you're Julius Randle and your predilection is to hunt a mismatch, you're going to get to hunt a mismatch. And that means the ball is probably going to stop a lot. If you're Jalen Brunson and your predilection is to hunt a mismatch, you're probably just going to get to hunt a mismatch. And that means the ball is going to stop a lot. And so the system is not necessarily encouraging these guys to be different. However, like the reason that Jalen Brunson, and this is not a knock on Jalen Brunson to be clear. He's a great player and he should be an all-star this year. Uh, the only reason Jalen Brunson is a point guard is because of his height. Mm. Jalen Brunson's a two guard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, like Jalen Brunson's a two. That's, that's the way he plays. He plays like a two. He's an awesome two. This is not a knock, but he plays like a two. Like when, when you ask, he doesn't, he doesn't think like a point guard. He doesn't play like a point guard. He generally doesn't hit his role men on pick and rolls. Right. He generally isn't saying, okay, Grimes hasn't touched the ball in a long time. Let me do something on this play so I can create a shot for him so he can get a rhythm going. What he is doing is he is finding creative, effective, and efficient ways to score. And he's making the team better because of it. Yeah. But yep. he's not a point guard per se. Yeah. Even though yeah. it's the position that he plays. And sometimes when you don't have that guy, the ball can just kind of stay stuck. Yeah. Yep. And that will happen with them. Uh, I will say, I think Julius Randle is on a hell of a run as a passer. He's looking good. Looking good. He has made, I mean, he was, he had an incredible passing game against Toronto. Yeah. And he has had some unbelievable passing games these last few weeks. Uh, you know, he, he went 14 for 19 in that Milwaukee game and had 41 points on 19 shots. And obviously when you do that, that's what's going to capture people's attention. He was an incredible passer in that game. He, he is, he has done a great job, not just passing, but creating threes. Like, yeah, all of his assists are threes now. It is a really great trait. Like, you'd rather... People don't really talk very much about assist selection the way they talk about shot selection. You yeah, know? yeah. The same yeah. way the same way that if you... You know, assist is viewed as, as an assist. But the same way that if it's better to score 15 points on seven shots than it is to score 15 points on 11 shots. It's better to have 15 points off of assists on seven shots, seven assists than it is on 11 assists. Mm -hmm. You look at the 11 assists and you're like, that's four more assists than the others. And what he's doing is he's just creating so many threes. The vast majority of his assists right now are three pointers. And that is huge. And that's why he's only averaging about five and a half assists a game right now. It's because a lot of those potential assists are going into the hands for shots that are 38% shots, 40% shots, but they're higher efficiency shots because they're standstill open catch and shoot threes. And he's getting the one assist, but he's generating a lot of points off of those assists. So he's, he's been, he's been great in that aspect, but I do kind of think it's just an element of the personnel yeah. mixed with the fact that the people in charge allow the personnel to play in that fashion. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And with Julius, it's it's almost like it, when when they were in the uh, the COVID shortened year, the way that he used to find Reggie Bullock a lot. They had had some excellent chemistry, especially the way that he would find him on the three point line. The way that Reggie Bullock would relocate to those open spaces, and Julius would always look for him. Also, I like the fact that you know even despite the gripes, it always seems like for Grimes, for example, for example, you know Grimes comes back, he comes off the bench. First two plays, they run for Grimes. You know, you could always see Julius trying to get those guys going after 
finding out that, you know, there, there is some uh, some issues there. So I, I like the fact that he's trying to get, you know, some of those guys going. And, and then just, again, his decision making. That's been the most important thing for me is how he handles uh, the extra attention to on the ball. Does he make the quick decision? Does he make the right read? And lately, he, he's been doing that, man. He, he's been doing it. And also, I, I like the fact that he's been trying to operate a little bit more through the paint. And really just trying to get aggressive, get those paint touches and either finish at the rim or find those guys. Because once the attention comes on him in the paint, somebody's going to be wide open. So I like the fact that he's he's been the aggressor and really trying to attack the rim. A lot more through the paint, like way more. And, and I used to not love a Julius Randle post up. And the reason why is because it almost always came 9, 12, 14 feet away from the rim. And that's right. just not good basketball. Right. Like they would, first of all, his weakness has always been dealing with doubles, double teams in the post, yep. recognizing yep. them early enough to be able to get off the ball. He's for the most part, he's gotten caught a couple of times here or there, but he's for the most part done a very good job recognizing double teams. The ones he has the most trouble with are the ones that come from the baseline. He just doesn't really mention it and some, uh, doesn't notice it. And sometimes he just turns into it. And those are the ones that he will struggle with the most. He has done a much better job recognizing those kinds of double teams. And mm -hmm. sometimes he's actually done a good enough job recognizing it that last night Toronto wasn't even really double teaming him until they absolutely yeah. had to. I, yeah, I was I was wondering that. I mean, you know, maybe I think it was it was a confidence in Barnes and 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 Anobi as single defenders that they it didn't really seem like they were sending a lot of attention until uh, absolutely necessary. They they weren't and I think I think part of it is that Ananobi is a defensive player of the year candidate, like he could show up on defensive player of the year ballots and you have faith in that guy. And I think another part of it has to be that they've watched Julius Randall's last 10 games. And they're like, this guy is slicing up teams whenever people send doubles now. And they're getting open standstill threes because of this. So would we rather give an open standstill three to Dante DiVincenzo mm -hmm. who's hitting everything he puts up these days or would we rather Julius Randle shoot a fadeaway two? And maybe it'll be closer to the basket, but it only counts for two. And Randle destroyed them, and then they felt like they had to send help. That's what a great player does. And when he was rolling, like he's been rolling like a great player lately. The thing that he's been doing that he has clearly put so much more of an emphasis on than he ever has before is that he he has noticed the difference between a five foot post up and a 10 foot post up. He has noticed the difference of what happens when you catch it with one or even two feet in the paint and how much easier that little fall away shot from six feet is than it is from 12. He's taking more shots from floater range than he has in any other year he's been with the Knicks. And those are good shots for him. Like, He's, he's shooting 50, 51% from floater range over the last two seasons. That's a good shot. Mm. He's got to gets, gets fouled on those shots because he's so good with that rip through. Yeah. He's able to catch guys, defenders. Like it's got a high foul rate points per possession on that shot out of a half court offense possession. Really good. Really good. That's really good offense. Now you add in the fact that he's creating open standstill threes from that position. Now you're like, the dude's been playing like a like a legitimate offensive hub, you know, for yeah. for a little bit now. He's playing great basketball and and they they need it right now because they're going to have to score a lot of points, I think. Absolutely. They're playing outstanding basketball. I mean, uh, you know, the the night I see him take it right to Giannis, man, I said this this is the guy this team needs on a nightly basis. Can't solve the Drew Holiday puzzle, and, and that I think that should be a credit to Drew Holiday and, and his defensive brilliance. But you know, seeing him take on Giannis and run through OG Ananobi, man, Julius has been playing ferocious basketball, man. It's good to see. You know what's funny about seeing him take on Giannis when they played in Milwaukee in the beginning of November. He had a couple of plays where he isoed on Giannis late in the game, and I asked him about it after the game, and it was just us, like no cameras chatting at the locker but it was an interview mm. and and i had asked him about it and i asked him if he thought it was good offense and he basically was like yeah i like i like that price that process i like mm. those shots and he knew that my implication was i didn't think it was good offense mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we had this very very cordial disagreement which ended in 
him saying that something happened on the court, me not quite being able to remember the play enough to refute it, even though I thought he was wrong, me asking him what he hypothetically considers to be catching the ball on the move Mm -hmm. and him tapping me on the back of the knee and saying, uh, now Fred, you're just making some stuff up. (laughs) So, so he, we've had a little bit of an inside joke about that moment Mm. for the last, for the last month, because I think somebody did call him out on going at Giannis Mm. and then to see him go back there and play in the in-season tournament quarterfinal, yeah, and go right at Giannis and me to be like, I guess it is good offense. I guess, I guess I got to eat crow. Yeah. (laughs) Got to eat crow on this one. Cause man, he, he's been doing this against like, these are, these are the best defenders in the world. Yeah, yeah. These are not good defenders. Giannis is a defensive player of the year. OG Ananobi is a constant. He, he Well, he's not yet a constant on all defense. By the time he's done playing, he will be a constant on all defense. He will be a yeah, many times yeah. all defensive member. Uh, these are Scotty Barnes is right. a really good defender. Like these are awesome defensive players. And he is operating just wonderfully. Absolutely steamrolling these guys. And it's been a, a sight to see. And when you you look through this schedule so far, 13 and 9. I mean, how many times they played Milwaukee so far? They played two against the Celtics. Um, you know, four of those nine losses have come to those guys. It's been a tough schedule so far. What have you made of, yes, you know, guys have been kind of griping about their role in the offense, but who have you seen so far as kind of that that locker room leader so far to kind of hold it together? Is it Julius? Is it Hart? Brunson? Who, who have you seen to kind of, you know, keep the guys and, you know, keep them tight? I think it's always Jalen Brunson. Like, that's that's his locker room. Mm. For sure. Like, he's, he's the guy at the top of it. He's the guy who I think commands the most respect. Uh, I think... I think it's really, it's really his team. It's really his locker room. I don't think there's, I couldn't even think of anyone else to say. Mm. It's mm. him. Fair, fair enough. Uh, until they bring back Taj, you know, to, for, for the yeah. insurance policy on Mitch. I'm yes. just waiting for that, man. I got my cell phone ready. Is Taj coming back? Is that the news that's going to break on Friday? Hey, now, now it could make sense. They got, they got three <laughs> guys who are non-guaranteed. They could yeah. use maybe another center with Mitch being out for a while. Like that's one where it's like, yeah. okay, makes sense. Even if he never plays like just break in case of emergency. Yeah. You know, yeah. like even if he never plays. True. True. Well, you know what, Fred, they could use a lot of things. And and when I polled the, the good people of Knicks fan TV on Twitter, I said, what do you guys want us to talk to Fred about? There was one common thread. It's been, it's been the common thread about this team. For years and years. And so we're going to get to that segment in just a second. But real quick, I got to salute everybody in the chat once again. Hit that thumbs up button for you, boys. CP the franchise. Fred Katz on the ones and twos. The quarter season report. Remember that this show is sponsored by BetterHelp, guys. It is holiday time. And holiday time is a great time for for a lot of people. You get to hang out with your family, friends. You open gifts. uh, No matter what holiday you celebrate. But for some people, uh, sometimes these times are some of the worst times for them. Sometimes they don't feel like they have an outlet or you're going through things i talked yesterday about you know spotify layoffs 1500 people laid off for the holiday so it it could be a tough time for people but uh just know that you're not alone and there is help out there and people who you can speak to if you're going through a tough time and that is with better help better help offers online therapy and it's convenient for you to you know handle your busy schedule and the thing about better help that's beneficial is that all you have to do is fill out a short questionnaire and they will pair you with the therapist that feels that they feel best suits your needs and the best thing about that is if you're not satisfied with who you have you can always switch at no cost to you so try it out Give it a try. Go to BetterHelp.com. Use promo code KFTV for 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp.com. Promo code KFTV for 10% off your first month. Okay, Fred. Now, on this theme of, you know, their roles in the offense, obviously, there's there's been a glut in the, in the, in the guard spot. We knew this with the, with the DiVincenzo acquisition coming in. Is the consolidation imminent? 
trade deadline is February 8th. December 15th is uh, the first period where certain players can be traded. Do you, Mitch is hurt. You have the Fournier contract losing its, its value. Is the college consolidation trade imminent? I think a trade will happen. I don't know if the consult. Well, define imminent before February eighth. Well, 8th or well by I mean by summer? by that time. And what I mean is like I don't see the big splash coming by that time. So when I say consolidation right. trade, I'm thinking a role player, an, another center. Is it an, is it a wing that they desperately need? They need wing depth. They need defense. Right. Is it something like that? A mid tier acquisition, a la Hart, a la D Rose, a, you know that type. Right. Is, is, is I, that I think imminent? something like that is more likely than not i'll say i think one of the guards for a non-guard however you want to define non-guard i think i think that's that's more likely than not it's certainly something they're searching for it's certainly something they're prioritizing i think the divincenzo signing what that gave them was kind of a a flexibility on the trade market where it was, okay, if we want to trade DiVincenzo, can do that. You want to trade Emmanuel quickly because you couldn't agree to an extension with him before this season. You're worried about how much money he could get in the free agency market this upcoming summer. Or you're worried that he won't be happy coming off the bench until the end of time. Then you could trade quickly. You can pair him with Evan Fournier's salary and you could bring something back. Uh, I, I think some sort of trade like that is on the table. What I don't think is that they will make a trade that makes it more difficult for them to make a star trade right. this summer. Right. Because that's been the overall objective. I, I, If they trade quickly, it'll be to get back someone really good. They're not just going to like give up quickly because they're like, oh, no, he's going to get paid and then we're screwed. Like, I, I, don't, right. I don't think it's not a panic. That's not a what's panic. going to happen. I, I really don't think so. If that if that were the case, they would be scouting out the quickly market much more aggressively than I believe them to be doing right now. Around this time last year, they were calling around teams and they were seeing how good of a first round pick they could get for quickly just to be able to gauge the market in case they were going to make a quickly trade. And to my knowledge, that's not happening now. Mm -hmm. I've been told that it's not happening now that they're not just kind of like offering up quickly. I do think that they would trade him if a good offer came along. Uh, you know, Fournier and quickly and picks for OG Ananobi mm. always made so much sense until lawsuits and mud started, started swinging, started to getting the north. involved. And exactly. <laughs> and then it's like, is the facial recognition going to keep Fournier out of MSG when he comes back? Right. And you don't even know. And, you know, but something like that makes sense. Uh, they can't trade Hart. Mm, right. Hart has a no trade for until the end of this season because he signed his extension too late. And, and you can't be traded until six months after the day that you extend. And six months after the day he extended is past the trade deadline. So they can't trade him before the trade deadline. They're obviously not trading Brunson. Mm. I, don't, I don't see a Randall midseason trade. Uh, I, I, I certainly, now that he's hurt, don't see a Mitchell Robinson deal. I also yeah. don't see them wanting to get off of centers. Isaiah Hartenstein is is very interesting to me because, you know, we don't talk about him as a trade candidate really at mm. all. And I'm not saying you could trade Hartenstein and get back this massive haul or something, but he's one of the best backup centers in the league. He makes $9.2 million this year. He's a free agent, unrestricted at the end right. of this year. And I think he's going to get a raise on that 9.2 million. Like, I right. think he is going to get an offer in the realm of the mid-level exception. There's about 13 million a year. I, I, I think that's what he'll end up getting. That's my guess. And I don't think the Knicks are going to be in a position financially to be able to pay a backup center that amount of money when you've got Hart's extension kicking in next year. You don't know what's going to happen with quickly, but chances are either you're keeping quickly and paying him 
20 million or whatever the heck it ends up costing, or you're trading quickly mid season for somebody who you also have to pay. So that's another contract that's coming in. You've got RJ Barrett making in the mid twenties. You've got Julius Randall making in the mid twenties. You've got Jalen Brunson making in the mid twenties and Jalen Brunson is up only a year from then. Right. And now you're going to have to pay Jalen Brunson a ginormous raise, something in the forties. Cause you're probably going to have to pay Brunson the max. Yeah. I think it's, and, I think it could be 50. It, it could. And you might, and you might have to pay Julius Randall a, a big raise because there's always a possibility. He has a fantastic year. The cap goes way up and he opts out because now he wants a big raise. And now if you've signed Hartenstein to two years and 13 million a year, three years, 12 million a year or something, it doesn't sound that big, but you've made your star trade at this point, which probably sent out at least one of those guys, but right. you've, you've made your star trade at this point. Now you've got your Brunson on a max. You've got your star on a max. You've got all these other guys making in the twenties. You got DiVincenzo making 10. You're in the tax now. Now that twelve million dollars to Hartenstein isn't just twelve million dollars. Now, now they're now it's compounding because you're paying all these tax dollars on top of it. Backup center is a position where you can go cheaper. You can go where cheap. You can get like, you can get like seventy percent of what Hartenstein does for twenty percent of the price. And I don't. That's why I don't really see why keeping Hartenstein is. I just consider it to be more likely than not that he's going to get a better offer elsewhere. Now, I don't know. Maybe he'll just want to stay with the Knicks and take less money because he loves being with the Knicks so yeah. much. But he's also 25 years old. Right. And hasn't made enough money in his career to deter him from $13 million a year if, if he's a person who cares about money, which most of us are. Yeah. And, and so I wonder how they're going to handle Hartenstein, you know, especially now that they have the Mitch injury. Letting him walk, it's not like a situation where it's like, oh, you can't let him walk. You have to trade him. It's not that. You can keep him, hope to make a run this year, and then when he walks, he walks. Uh, but but he he's going to have an interesting trade deadline, especially with with Mitchell Robinson's injury now being a thing. Um, I mean, I'm watching a bunch of those guys. It's still too early to know exactly what's going to happen. I, I've made calls around the league, mm -hmm. and – the, the the phones aren't very active around the league right now. Like teams mm. just aren't really talking. It was more active last year. Wow. It was definitely more active last year. And I think that'll change. But it's just early. It's two months till the trade deadline. Yeah. And I, I think it'll things will change around December fifteenth when a bunch of players open up as trade eligible. A couple of people in the chat uh picked a name who, you know, when I was before we started this show, I've been I've been trying to think of just off the cuff names. I'm you know, I don't see the EMP thing happening. Um it, you know, Spider, I think, is more of a summertime possibility. I still think that's a possibility. I've, I've been trying to think of off the cuff names. But here's one. He is a CAA uh client. It's burning down there in Washington, your former team. Is Kyle Kuzma the mystery guy? Yeah, that's something that I thought about too. I was just calling up a, a list of the standings and just kind of looking down. I I don't mm. think it's any of the Bulls guys. No, 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 no. I don't. No. I don't. Uh, I think I think you could get Hayward for cheap if Probably, you wanted yeah. to get him. Yeah. Tibbs has always been a big Hayward guy for yeah. what it's worth. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I did they offer? Him. I think they offered Hayward like. I forgot the deal that, that well, the, the rumor deal when, when he was a free agent. I mean, they, they were hot, hot after Hayward. Yeah. And it was Tibbs. Tibbs, Tibbs wanted him. Mm. Tibbs is, Tibbs is a big Hayward guy. He still likes Hayward a lot. I don't think you can get Boyan Bogdanovich for cheap. Mm. I, I just keep hearing from everybody that the Pistons just want to keep Bogdanovich. They view him as essential to the culture. I don't know what the culture is. Monty, <laughs> 20 straight losses. Oh Monty God. Monty loves him. I'm like, if he's essential to that culture, I might trade him. <laughs> right. I, they, he's a good player. I mean, I would think that it was all posturing on the Pistons part if they didn't do the exact same thing with Jeremy Grant. Where they signed Jeremy Grant to three years, 20 million. Grant had a good first year. The Pistons stunk. They didn't trade him. It was fine. He had two and a half years left at that deadline. The next year, the Pistons stunk again with no real hope of being good the following year. And they didn't trade him at the deadline again. And 
when you spoke to teams who who spoke to them on the phones, they they were saying that the Pistons were basically saying like, yeah, it's going to take a ton to get Jeremy Grant. Mm. We love Jeremy Grant. He's incredibly important to our team. And they're like, yeah, but your team is at the bottom of the standings. Why do you need him? And then and then they waited so long to trade Grant. They eventually traded him to Portland when he was on an expiring, and they just got a late first round pick for him, and mm-hmm. that was it. Bogdanovich is guaranteed twenty million this year. He's non guaranteed for next year at nineteen million, but he's worth nineteen million. So as long as he's healthy, that's going to be picked up. And I just wonder if Detroit's going to find itself in the same situation with Bogdanovich, where they wait too long, yeah, to trade him and they do it because I keep hearing that like. Yeah, you can call about Bogdanovich and they'll pick up the phone, but you better make such a good offer that it it would blow your damn mind. Yeah. Which isn't gonna happen. No one's doing that for Bogdanovich. Kuzma. Here's my Kuzma deal. He's having too much fun this season. That's my like hot. It's like my hot, like normally I'm very rational. <laughs> yeah. I'm 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 not a talking head at all. I watch way too much Wizards. <laughs> he's having way too much fun this season. That he is having way too much fun being able to do whatever, whatever he, he wants, wants <laughs> on a team that has no <laughs> discipline. The Washington and, let it flies, man. The Washington let he, it flies. Exactly. And he has proven that he can be part of a winning culture. Mm. Obviously. Literally won a title. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. and even last year, I thought he had a really nice season. The shot selection is obviously incredibly dicey, but he was playing solid defense, good on ball defender, great rebounder for his position. This year, the defense has really dissipated. That's almost certainly a you know an effect of the culture there. Hmm. I don't know. I watch him, and I'm like. I just struggle to figure out how anyone who could have that much fun in that situation could work for Tibbs. Yeah. I'm like, Tib could work for the guy who said winning is more fun than fun is fun. <laughs> well, look, Kuz is a fashion guy. We could offer him, you know, the fashion week. He's right here in New York. He might love that. Yeah, and look, I, I don't want to make it seem like I'm hating on Kyle Kuzma. He's he's a good he's a good player, and it's it's clear that he can be part of the you know really a part of a winner. He's 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 done it. Yeah, I just first of all, it's a big contract, and he's on year one. And and we're talking about how the Knicks are going to get expensive. That's that's another long term bite into your financial flexibility right before you've gotten the star right i also don't love kuzma as a three i i i think he's better as a four four i think he's a lot better playing that position down he's he's not a great shooter he's just a very willing shooter and he can get really hot and have great shooting games but he can also have games where he just hits rim hits rim hits rim hits rim hits rim every time and teams are going to sag off of him and i i don't love him as a three next to julius randall offensively i just don't think that and then barrett at the two in that situation i guess is just like and i wouldn't trade any of those guys for kuzma like i wouldn't trade barrett for kuzma you know like so i i i just don't really see how kuzma really works um, you know, we'll see exactly what happens. Like, I think Jeremy Grant is gettable, mm. even with but that it, contract. Because I mean, he's well, got years. That's as well. why he's gettable. Mm. That yeah, I mean, that, yeah. But but you know, you're. Do you want that contract? That's, no. <laughs> no. It's one of the one of the 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 least team friendly contracts in the league, right? right. And Jeremy Grant, I really like him as a player. He's a really, he's a really good player. He just also has a really good agent. Yeah, yeah. but he's a really good player. Like Jeremy Grant's a winning player. Jeremy Grant's forty percent three point shooter. Plays the right way. Plays his ass off. Could play for Tibbs. Takes the game really seriously. Good scorer. Good around the rim. Really good defender. Plays crazy hard. Like crazy athlete. 
Like Jeremy Grant's a very good player. Mm -hmm. Um, But that's a really expensive contract. It's a really expensive contract. I don't know who the guy is. I don't think it's any of the Bulls guys. I don't think so. I don't think it's any of the Bulls guys. What I don't what and, and and part of the reason why I think we haven't heard the phones be ringing off the hooks so far is because there are a lot of teams still trying to compete. Mm. Like there haven't really been any teams that have fallen out. Like there are four teams in the West who have fallen out of it, right? And there are like four teams in the East, maybe three teams in the East who would admit that they've fallen out of it. Yeah. I think if you ask the Raptors, have you fallen out of it at nine and 14? I don't think the Raptors would say we've fallen out of it. Right. Right. I think if you ask the Hawks at nine and 13, have you fallen out of it? I don't think they would say we've fallen out of it. Maybe things change. Maybe there's a Hawks guy you can go get Hunter. Maybe. What do you think? I think Deandre Hunter is very gettable. I think that's somebody they have definitely been. I I've heard for a long time. They've been open to moving him. Mm. Um, I think, uh, Bogdan Bogdanovich is is somebody. Does he have a restriction on him? I can't remember. Let me double check. His, well, he, did, he his deal kicked in when last year, right? Right. I don't think he has a restriction on him. Uh, Bogdanovich maybe is somebody if they're you know if they're just you know right now they have a four oh nine winning percentage. He's he's got a team option in twenty six twenty seven. So he's okay. got eighteen this year, seventeen, sixteen, and then a team option for sixteen. Gotcha. So, I mean, that's a good contract for him. He He's a very underrated player. Yeah. He stepped it up. Like, that knee injury kind of slowed him down a little bit. But he, he seems like he's coming back. Had a good FIBA as well. Nobody ever mentions him for sixth man of the year. It's true. That's I don't true. know why. Yeah. yeah I don't know why. True. He's getting buckets. That dude. Yeah. That dude is such a good scorer. Yeah. And he and, killed the next uh, couple years ago in that, in that playoff. He killed him, man. He can shoot. He can score off the dribble. He can pass. And like he's not your typical six man who just comes in and chucks and yeah. just tries to get his, you know. Like he scores, but he does it. You never sit there and say, "Oof, what a terrible shot by Bogdanovich! What a selfish player!" Like he's a very good player. Mm-hmm. He's somebody you put him at the three for them. That would he would make sense. He can shoot the hell out of the ball. Mm-hmm. Plays good defense. Yeah, I mean there are a couple of guys on on the Hawks, who I think could make sense in that, in that way. I, I don't think it would take a ton to get Deandre Hunter, but I think there's a reason it wouldn't take a ton to get Deandre Hunter. He yeah. again has kind of an expensive contract and, and, and he's very hit or miss. He's not quite yeah. the defender that everybody expected him to they, be. They thought he was going to be the next Kawhi. Remember when he was coming out of UVA, man, they thought that was the next Kawhi Leonard. Oh yeah. Had a good Absolutely. tournament run. Absolutely. And I'm like, I'm curious to see what the Hawks do with their centers. You know, we'll see exactly how Mitch recovers from all of this. Mm. But I'm curious to see what the Hawks do with their centers because they they just extended Anyeka Okongwu. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, they still have Capella. Yeah. They're still starting Capella over him. And, and, and I could see them, if the right offer were made for Capella, I could see them wanting to, using that as a way to open up minutes for Okongwu. Mm, that yeah, would be a yeah. very complicated trade. It would be, I don't see that happening with the Knicks. They already have Robinson. They have Robinson for multiple years and bringing in Capella using resources on that would be really weird. I don't think that's going to happen, yeah. especially now that I say it out loud. I really don't think that's going to happen, but I could see like, I, I, I could see Capella being traded before that, that contract expires for sure, mm. whether it's to somebody else. My my center pick was Kelly Olynyk. What do you think about that? Man? Oh, yeah, that's a good one. That's my guy, man. See, I mean, look, I've been telling these Knicks fans for like weeks now. Well, actually, before they got iHeart, I said, go get Kelly Olynyk. If we're going to try to go get stretch five, switch up the offense a little bit, go get Kelly Olynyk. Expiring contract, $12 million. You got Utah with a crowded front court. That could be the guy. And, and maybe insurance if iHeart leaves. Underrated player. Yeah. He's a good Talk player. To him. He's he's actually a people think of him as a stretch five, but he like does stuff with the ball. He's kind of a playmaking five. Like he yeah. does stuff with the ball. He could pass. He could he could attack closeouts. He's having a hell of a year. 
I mean, he's been really good. Well. He's shooting well. He's 64% on twos, 46% on threes right now, 66% effective field goal percentage. He's yeah. kind of just been draining shots for a few years now. He's yeah. really become this insanely efficient player. That's a good one. He's he's a really he's a really quality player, but he's also not the rim protection right. sort of type. Yeah, that, yeah. That Tibbs usually, you know, tries to tries to bring in. Um, I'm trying to think like if there's just like a low level. It could just be that they try to find some sort of low level guy to bring in at the end of the roster too. Mm. And like, like instead of going out and signing Taj Gibson, that they make a trade for someone's third string center. Who's Mm. this stringy athletic rim protecting sort of guy. Yeah. And they see, okay, let's see what you can do. You know, is, is the, the 48 contract. I mean, this is hella high water by trade deadline. I mean, they they got to find a uh, make a move here. I mean, they, they they've got the team option on it for for after this. But so I mean, is it just let them walk or try to use that contract for something? Well, you can use him in a trade like I was talking about before, where you pair him with quickly, or you pair him with Grimes, and all of a sudden that can get you back a salary in the twenty millions. Mm-hmm. And you could do that at the deadline you could end up not trading him because no good trade amounts or because you're unable to put one together and then you could buy him out or, and I would not put this past the Knicks because this would be the Knicks are, are, are eccentrists with their salary cap management Mm -hmm. stuff. You could hold him hostage for the entire year and he has the team option. And if a star trade comes up on draft night, which is before the team option deadline, you can pick up Fournier's team option for 19 million and you can use that expiring salary Mm. in the star trade. Okay. But you would have to know, I think that team option deadline is like June 20th. It's either June 27th or 29th. I think maybe it's the 24th. It's something in the last week of June. Mm. I don't know off the top of my head. So if you know at the draft, like, oh, this is coming together, what, e- even if maybe it doesn't literally actually get executed on that day, but you're like, oh, we're so close. This yeah. is happening. Yeah. You can pick up the Fournier contract and then you can execute the trade and like agree to the trade on draft night or around draft night or whatever. And then you can actually execute the trade, uh, you know, on in January or in January, in July, I mess up my J months. Yeah. Mexico, the trade in, in July and use Fournier's expiring salary in order to do that. So you could hold him hostage because that is possible. Star trades don't always happen in free agency. I mean, right. they're more likely to happen in the off season, but sometimes they happen on draft night. And if the Knicks have really set their eyes on, on that as being the goal, which they have, one way for them to be able to maintain that flexibility in a trade for a star without, cause like otherwise you might have to include RJ Barrett just for salary mm. reasons. Yeah. Right. You know? Right. You might have to include somebody else just for salary reasons, somebody who you don't want to include. And mm-hmm. it's nice to be able to have that big number come out of a guy who's not in your rotation mm. and doesn't hurt you from a basketball perspective to lose. So they could hold him hostage for the whole year for that reason alone. Mm. Okay. I, I I don't know how it's going to be handled though. Yeah, so they do have a little they, bit of time. They might they might also have some mercy for him and be like, yeah. Evan, <laughs> you other than a couple of comments over the summer, which, quite honestly, like what human being couldn't understand that, you know? Yeah, like, yeah. I mean, he took out the flamethrower, man. Still didn't work. Totally. <laughs> and, We'll see you at the office, man. We'll see you at MSG, man. But, like, he's been a good trooper, you know? Like, you talk to guys in that locker room, and they're all, like, they all say the same thing about him. They all talk about what a good teammate he is, Mm -hmm. you know? They all talk about how helpful he is to all the young guys and how he doesn't actually complain to them and how he's obviously unhappy Mm -hmm. in his role and unhappy not playing, but how he still kind of shows up and puts on a good face and you know, is, is just a good teammate to everybody. And it's like, 
the Knicks also might be like, okay, we have ruined any chance for you to get paid. We'll, mm. we'll, we'll, you know, show some mercy. Yeah. We'll let you go to another team where you're going to play and maybe you'll get something. Mm. Interesting. Uh, once again, we're talking to Fred Katz, Knicks insider for the athletics. So to everybody in the chat, once again, hit the like button, hit the share button, subscribe to the channel. KFTV's quarter season report live. We're going at it live, man. Had a great discussion so far. Uh, last question, quick. Uh, knee injury. Uh, uh, are you hearing anything? Is it a day to day situation? They're, they fly to Utah today, right? Uh, or there should be, or was it last night that they flew to Utah and they'll play the Jazz on Wednesday? Yeah, fly to Utah today with with uh, with quickly. You mean okay? Yeah, with yeah. quickly. You're asking? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. No, I haven't. I haven't heard anything. Um, anything concrete on what's going on with the knee injury? Uh, I I I'm still kind of waiting to hear updates on that. And uh, you know, the fact that he was questionable going into that game was more encouraging than not. Um, and quickly is has proven to be very durable. I, I wouldn't be losing sleep over it right now, but you know, sometimes these things change. I, I, I honestly don't know right now what to make of that quickly knee injury, but we'll get an update tomorrow. What do you make of after this jazz game? I mean, the rest of the schedule, it's all 500 from there teams above 500 and, and it ends in OKC in Orlando, in Indiana. I, I forget the, the order, but it ends with and then and then and then they come home for Minnesota. Happy New Year, right? Here's hopefully you didn't drink too much last night. Here's Ant Man, here's Carl Anthony Towns in the Stifle Tower, the best defense and one of the best teams in the NBA. You know, I may I I think it's maybe it's a little too early to say, you know, what will it say about this team coming out of it, but it's a tough it's another tough stretch for them, man. They're gonna be tested it's a again. Really brutal. brutal stretch. Yeah. They got they got to win in Utah on Monday or on Wednesday. Like that is the first game of the road trip. They're they're going to be fresh, and then after that, like you said, ten straight games against teams five hundred or over, and eight of or what is it? Seven of those ten games are on the road. On the road, like on the that road. is yeah. That and is and the two home games are against the Bucks. Merry Christmas, like Christmas two step. <laughs> it gets a team that just likes to shoot threes all over the place, man. I know that's really tough. That's really tough. I don't know. Are we going through the games and picking them? Um, That that might be a little depressing. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? Let's let's save it for the next one. Let's save it. If they can, if they can come out of this stretch five and six, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. If they can come out of this five and six, then they're what? 18. And what are they now? Well, 13 and nine. They're 18. Yeah. Then they're 18 yeah. and 15. Yeah. Heading into a cushier part of the schedule. And they still don't have Mitch, but they've kind of picked up some good road wins against good teams without him. Probably have some confidence going into that stretch. Like if they're five and six in this stretch, they don't have to kill it. They just have to survive. You know, that's it. That's it. Just survive is the name of the game, man. And the deadline will be trade deadline will be February 8th. Then we'll have all star break. And so after that, hopefully you'll come back and join us for the the halftime report. And we'll see. Will it be a new team? We'll see how they get out of it. Uh, You know, will they kill each other in the West Coast trip? We'll, We'll see who makes it back on the next episode of Knicks Fan TV Live, man. Fred, thanks again for the time. Uh, you just dropped a piece today on The Athletic. Let, let the people know what, what they can expect. Yes, so I have a piece up on The Athletic just about like 10 random thoughts about life without Mitchell Robinson for the Knicks, talking about how they can fill in for him, what happens to the rebounding, some of the stuff we touched on today, the Sims versus Hartenstein starting sort of thing. Um, I also have a podcast now called Cats yes. and Shoot. Yep. And uh, if you enjoy my stuff, you can subscribe to it uh, on at uh, patreon.com slash cats and shoot. And you can subscribe to it there. You can get either one episode a week or two episodes a week, depending on the package that you sign up for. And uh, you can find all my writing on on The Athletic. 
There it is, man. There it is. Thanks again, Fred. And salute to everybody in the chat once again. Hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, once again, hit the like button, hit the share button, and subscribe to our channel. Uh, thanks again to our sponsors of today's video, BetterHelp. Go to BetterHelp.com. Use promo code KFTV for 10% off your first month. Online therapy, convenient for you. Definitely try it out. And remember that these shows are available in audio podcast format. No reason to miss it. If you missed today's live show, salute to the replay gang if you're watching watching it on demand but you can also catch it on all major podcast platforms uh as we said wednesday night we'll be back for post game live knicks versus jazz and we'll, we'll uh we'll catch up with you guys then man cp the franchise fred Katz. thanks again everybody have a great